Good evening. How's the volume? Everybody here okay? Not too loud, not too quiet? Okay, good. Um, I'm Angela Mettler. I work in the president's office at the School of Mines. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's STEAM Cafe. Uh, STEAM Cafe is a partnership between the School of Mines, South Dakota Public Broadcasting, and Hey Camp Brewing. We couldn't do it without them, and we can't do it without you. So thank you for coming, those of you who are here in person and those of you who are watching online. Um, at the end, we will take questions from the audience, and that includes our online audience as well. So if you're listening online and you have any questions, uh, go ahead and type your question into either the chat box or the Q&A. Uh, either way, we will get that answered for you at the end. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Bryce Tellman, you're up. Hello. Uh, first of all, you will notice all of you actually have a little bit of homework at your tables. Uh, there's a little sheet of paper that simply asks you to outline and label the region that you understand yourself to be from. Right, so this is not a geography quiz. This is just based on how you understand it. Uh, and I'll actually refer to these a little bit uh, in the early part of this presentation. So if there's any chance that one of my colleagues would be willing to kind of collect them from the tables, maybe just put them in a pile up here, that would be great. Uh, as Angela said, I'm Dr. Bryce Tellman. Uh, you know, the title of the presentation, I went back and forth a lot on. I'm not sure I'm crazy about this one, but this is what we're doing. Uh, defining the Great Plains, reinventing a region through ideas and stories. And I feel like that requires a little bit of clarification. Uh, so the his, a Western historian, P Patricia Nelson Limerick, talks about this idea of what she calls prickly regional consciousness. The idea that when someone starts talking about where we're from, you know, whether that's our state or our region, we get a little bit prickly about it, right? We maybe start to feel just a little bit defensive because that's our place. And this defensiveness, that's exactly, for me, kind of the point or what makes this idea of regions interesting to me. So rest assured when I say, you know, reinventing a region, uh, this is not me starting the revolution to kind of go out and reinvent the Great Plains. Uh, instead, kind of what I want to look at is how we have reinvented the Great Plains and how we continue to do so. So let me be clear about what kinds of claims I'll be making tonight. Uh, I'm not presenting a comprehensive history of the Great Plains that's uh, well beyond my abilities and well beyond the time that we have here. Uh, instead, what I want to be doing is examining some of the most persistent ideas that we've had about the Great Plains. So before we start a conversation about kind of how we talk about the Great Plains as a region, also any of you who borrowed a marker, those actually belong to my daughter, Naomi. Uh, so you're welcome to use them. Just make sure they get back because she's got Anna and Elsa and so that sort of thing to color over there. So before we start a conversation about the Great Plains as a region, it makes sense for us, I think, to work with some definitions, right? So what exactly are regions? This seems like a little bit of a silly question because we talk about regions all the time, but it's one of those words that we use very easily and very lightly, but because we use it so frequently, we often don't quite define it. And so for the purposes of what I do and for the purposes of our conversation tonight, I define regions in kind of a three-part definition as unstable geocultural fictions. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. So what does that mean? All right, let's take, when, let's take that one at a time. So first, regions are unstable, meaning that regions change. They're rarely ever set. Now, sometimes we'll set a region for some functional purpose, right? Like the Census Bureau defines the Midwest as these states for the purposes of measuring changes there over time. But when we talk about regions generally, the Midwest, the South, the Northeast, the Great Plains, we recognize that those definitions are fuzzy. And a lot of times when we talk about regions, they exist in kind of an in-between area of definition between official 
and unofficial, right? They're not as official as state boundaries, though we recognize that we can't just completely make up a new region and for it to make sense. And they also exist between often, not always, but often between local and national, right? And, and at least in the context of the United States and North America, when we talk about region, we're usually talking about something that's more than just a state, but not the entire country. And as such, they often cross borders, right? Regions, part of the reason I like regions is that they can cause some trouble because they don't always hew to the uh, particular and often arbitrary political uh, boundaries that we set up, such as those between North and South Dakota or South Dakota and Wyoming. So regions are unstable. Regions are geocultural. Now, this is obviously uh, an attempt by myself to sneak two words in when I pretend that I'm only using one. But we usually, again, not always, think of regions in terms of geographical space. That is, if I ask you a question about region, I'm usually asking a where question, right? If I ask what region are you from, you usually understand that as a geographic question. Now, a scholar by the name of Jeanette Ailey has my personal favorite definition of region, and I'm kind of a collector of definitions of region. She defines them as containers for stories. And I like that definition because it points to the fact that while regions are usually a map question, a geographical question, that geography is usually in the service of some sort of cultural, political, or other narrative distinction. And so that's why I say, geocultural geography yes but also some of this other broadly cultural baggage uh, and we'll that kind of informs a lot of what we talk about in today's presentation and then finally regions are fictions simply put they're made up right if we drive from sioux falls to rapid city there's no line that says you know the great plains begins here and even if there were, it would only be because we had decided that some line was arbitrarily significant. And so regions are fictional, they're made up. But uh, James Shortridge, who is a scholar of the Midwest, both as a region and as the term, uh, reminds us that just because something is fictional doesn't mean it's not real, right? Flags, anthems, countries themselves are all fictional, right? They're made up but they become real because we practice them. They end up having real effects on our lives because we understand them to be descriptive of some reality for ourselves. So are regions made up and do they change? Yes, but are they still real? Do they still have impacts on us? Also, yes. So what are regions? Unstable geocultural fictions, at least for the purposes of tonight. If you can agree to assent to that definition for the next like half hour, we'll be okay. And then after that, we can argue about it. So, all right, that's what regions are. What is the Great Plains, right? This is not a, a presentation about regionalism broadly. We're talking about a particular region, one that I have some affection for, the Great Plains. Well, uh, you're there to start with. Well, probably, maybe. So when we talk about the Great Plains, the Great Plains has been called a lot of things. It's been called America's steppes, uh, comparing it to the Russian steppes, similar grasslands landscape. It's been called flyover country, a definition we're probably, a lot of us are probably familiar with. It's been called the Great American Desert. Uh, it's been called the breadbasket. It's been called one of America's greatest mistakes. It's also been called a favorite stopover for literary carpetbaggers. The idea that people come to the Great Plains, they write something profound about it, and then they go back to New Jersey or wherever. Now, we usually define it as something close to the semi-arid, right? There's not a lot of moisture, but it's not quite desert. The semi-arid, mostly grassy area between the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and I know those of you viewing online can't see the laser pointer, but you probably know about where the Rocky Mountains are. Between the Rocky Mountains and, you know, the part to the east with more water, generally. Now, I've asked a number of you to kind of indicate what region you understand yourselves to be from. Uh, unsurprising to me is someone just circled Texas. 
Uh, at least one of you kind of circled, and this is a pretty common definition, this tier of states here, kind of this stack of states, the Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and don't worry, I won't go through all of these. Someone else has kind of indicated this block of states here, the Dakotas, Nebraska, Minnesota, and Iowa, suggesting they are actually more similar. And we have some people uh, outlining just South Dakota, or a particular part of South Dakota, which is as fine, Roberts County, the state of Illinois, Tennessee, the Southwest. So when we talk about where is the Great Plains, and as I tried to caution you guys before I started having you fill these out, thank you, uh, by the way. I, when people stop to my office to talk about things, sometimes I'll arbitrarily say like, yes, but could you first fill one of these out? Because it's interesting to me. A while back, a couple decades, two geographers by the name of Rossman Levin went to a great deal of effort, more than I'm going to go to tonight, and made a uh, kind of a composite map of 50 different published borders of the Great Plains. So these are not random borders. They didn't just uh, survey a room of very knowledgeable people about the borders of the Great Plains, but these were published borders of the Great Plains and various works about the Great Plains or about American regionalism generally. And this is the composite map that they came up with. And so you can see it's all over the place uh, quite a bit. And so we have uh, at kind of the border cases, you know, things going all the way up into Canada, almost to the Beaufort Sea up here, and then all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Sometimes we're going all the way over to Louisiana and Mississippi. Sometimes we're including you know, a decent chunk of the, the Rocky Mountains as well. And again, these are all published accounts. And so what I wanna emphasize is that there is no very starkly agreed upon, these are the borders of the Great Plains. It's just not really a thing. We can see from this though, that there is an area of broad agreement. Like kind of this area of Eastern Montana, Western Dakotas and Western Nebraska and Western Kansas for the most part represents a broad area of agreement that this is the Great Plains. You'll note that a lot of definitions kind of arbitrarily cut it off at the US Canada border. A lot of times that has to do with what questions the researchers or geographers are pursuing. If they're only interested in the United States, they're pretty likely to just draw arbitrary line at the 49th parallel there. What's also interesting about this map, you'll note that we here in the Black Hills are sometimes excluded. Even though we are squarely right in the middle of Great Plains Agreement area, sometimes we get a special little exclusion zone to say, yes, you're there, but this place is not quite the Great Plains because we don't quite hew to what defines the Great Plains, which is usually grasslands, more or less treeless, largely flat-ish. Though truth be told, I'm not that interested in identifying the correct boundaries of the Great Plains or any of the regions that you guys are from. And I'll be uh, looking through these with great interest later. I look at the story that we tell about this region, the means by which we tell that story, and kind of what we do with that story or the effects that the story has. So how do we tell the Great Plains story? The kind of short way to look at a much longer answer is a lot of ways. But in the work that I do in the research that I've done, which is mostly informed by kind of looking at historical case studies or different struggles about how to enact certain kinds of political change or manage cer certain kinds of outcomes, there are three themes, three dimensions by which we tell this story that come up again and again and again. And these, what I refer to as dimensions of regionalism, are space, time, and language. And I'll go through these one by one with some prominent examples. So first, space. And this is what we've started our conversation with. It's the easiest entry point into regionalism, right? That question of where. And historically on the, the Great Plains, there have been a number of voices that have really had outsized influence in determining what we mean when we say the Great Plains. Anyone recognize this guy? Shout it out if you do, good looking guy. John Wesley Powell, that's right. Of course, of course. 
And so John Wesley Powell is usually recognized as the first, or is usually kind of pointed to as the first person to recognize or suggest the Great Plains as a distinct physiographic unit. And this would be in his report on the lands of the arid regions of the United States around 1895. And in that report, he says the, here's a new word for you, Isayetl, some people probably know how to pronounce that word, I don't, but the Isayetl or mean annual rainfall line of 20 inches, in a general way, it may be represented by the 100th meridian. So for John Wesley Powell, who's particularly interested in kind of the water landscape of the West, he wants to know where can we put this line between the humid you know, our water rich areas of the country and the semi arid regions of the country. And for him, that's about at the 100th meridian. Now, back in May, uh, Mark Anderson, a mines faculty member, gave a really excellent presentation about America's aging uh, water infrastructure. And he pointed to Powell as one of the earliest voices saying, hey, we need to do things differently here in the West, right? There's not a lot of water here. We need to settle this area differently. So if you haven't looked at his presentation, it's Mark Anderson, I really recommend doing so after you watch this presentation, but go check that one out too. And so it's from Powell that we get this uh, 100th meridian as kind of a really meaningful line. Yes. What a great segue. So it's right about, thank you very much. So it's approximately right here. Now, I know the danger of giving a presentation as a MINES faculty member is that there may be geographers in the crowd and they'll be like, well, actually, on this projection, it's approximately right here. Do not use any of my maps for navigation. You know, it's approximately right here. I'm from North Dakota, so I usually use North Dakota towns as kind of my reference points. You know, so you're roughly between around Jamestown as far as that. And so in South Dakota, it would be, I don't know, Mitchell-ish. Uh, anyone, a uh, tr the Tragically Hip fan, the Canadian band, they have a song called uh, West of the 100th, 100th Meridian, where the Great Plains begin. And so when you hear the 100th Meridian as some kind of point, that's largely the influence of Powell, saying that to the west of here, and he allowed, he doesn't claim that, you know, there's this straight absolutely straight water line that goes down the middle of the United States. You know, he allows this is going to go east, this is going to go west. But in general, the 100th meridian is the point to the west of which average rainfall falls below 20 inches per year, which at least at that time, uh, less so now, but at that time was considered kind of the uh, do or die point of being able to carry on agriculture successfully. And so he says west of here, things need to be different. We can't live to the west of here like we do to the east of here. And he had a lot of interesting recommendations about how to manage water in this area that people are bringing up a lot again now as we face water shortages, especially in the western and southwest United States. All of his recommendations were ignored. Um, so what are you going to do? All right, Frank, how about this one? You know who this is? All right. Uh, Another, probably even more outsized voice on how we view the Great Plains in terms of uh, space is Texas historian Walter Prescott Webb. So in 1931, Walter Prescott Webb publishes a book titled The Great Plains. Uh, and he is really the one to popularize that name. People had used that name before him. Powell used the name The Great Plains. But after Webb uses it in what becomes a pretty popular book, that's when The Great Plains kind of enters the national lexicon. And he gives much more weight to this 20-inch line than Powell does. So Powell says it's a big deal. Um, Walter Prescott Webb is even more emphatic in this regard. And he said, this is in the very beginning of his book, one sees what may be called an institutional fault comparable to a geological fault running from the middle of Texas to Illinois or Dakota, roughly following the 98th meridian. At this fault, the ways of life and of living changed. And he would go on to say that every institution that was carried along uh, across this fault was either broken or completely changed. And it's notable that he puts uh, his line at the 98th meridian, so a little bit further east. So now we're getting closer to, not quite to like Fargo and Sioux Falls, but a little bit closer to this side of the state. And uh, for, for Webb, the kind of 
the through line of his book. It's a long book. I don't really recommend reading the whole thing. You can if you want. He really emphasizes the middle nature of the Great Plains as distinct from the West. And that's one of the confusing things about the Great Plains sometimes. Is it kind of a transition zone between the East and the West? Is it, you know, kind of the West light? Are we getting to the West? Is it part of the Midwest? Um, as some of you expressed, which is a perfectly fine position to hold. Um, and Walter Webb says, no, it's its own thing. Because further West, you know, and kind of what we might call the true West, where things are very arid, he says there's kind of not that invitation uh, to hope in terms of agriculture, but that it's in this middle area, this middle ground, where we really encounter some of these difficulties, where some years might have enough moisture uh, for farming, but some years may not. Now, Walter Prescott Webb celebrated uh, this fault line in the Great Plains because of these examples that he saw as successful adaptation. Now, when we talk about Walter Prescott Webb, he is very much writing an Anglo-American history of the Great Plains. Uh, he begins his history with the um, uh, Spanish kind of coming up from the, the south. And basically he says, these are Walter's uh, views, not mine. Uh, it says like, you know what, they couldn't hack it. But then when the Anglo-Americans came uh, west, you know, we did these great innovations and whatnot and really made a stable society. A uh, book comes out in 1931. 1930s turns out to be not a great decade uh, for the Great Plains. <laughs> which is also part of what in that time puts the Great Plains as a region kind of into the national vocabulary. So coming forward in time now in our uh, exploration of some of these uh, big influences on place, this is the map that arguably right now the authority, if we're going to choose one authority on the Great Plains uses, this is from University of Nebraska Lincoln, and they have the Center for Great Plains Studies. And you'll note that their map is actually a little bit more capacious than either of the lines we've talked about before. Now they have indicated on here the 98th meridian. Uh, poor Powell doesn't get the 100th meridian on there, but we do have the 98th meridian on there. But they have expanded the region out a little bit to the eastern border of kind of this uh, tier of states. And they do this intentionally. And uh, Walter Weisart, uh, who's a great guy, I've talked to him, uh, talks about this decision. He says, these states were organized and settled later than the adjoining states to the east and their institutions and iconographies give them a coherence that should not be divided. And I think that's a perfectly defensible decision. What's interesting now is that we see a little bit of a expansion from a strict kind of hydrological or physiographic uh, interpretation of the border of the region, you know, determining it only on uh, kind of a water line. And now we have the addition of some of these cultural characteristics saying that, hey, because these have cultural and institutional and political similarities, you know, they need to be included as part of the region. My own uh, personal conspiracy theory about this regional border, and I know everyone out there has their own conspiracy, conspiracy theories about regional borders. We all have them. You know, if you follow the normal, uh, not normal, but traditional 98th Meridian uh, border, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, which is home of the Center for Great Plains Studies, is actually outside the region that it studies. <laughs> If you, you know, push that border to the east a little bit, then, oh, hey, look, we're, we're in the region. And in fact, this whole tier of uh, land grant universities is suddenly in the region. So that's, that's my personal conspiracy theory. And then, and I know this isn't the, the best map to be uh, looking at. It's meant to be red, not projected. Uh, so this is from a 2012 report entitled The Rise of the Great Plains uh, by a guy named Joel Kotkin, who is kind of talking about the economic future of the Great Plains. It's a very boosterish document saying, hey, people keep saying that the Great Plains has all these problems, that these communities suffer from out migration, that it's depressed. He says, no, you know, things have never looked better for the Great Plains. And this is the map that he uses. And he starts with University of Nebraska Lincoln's definition. And then he pushes it out just a little bit, in his words, modified to account for immediately adjacent metropolitan counties. Now, so if you start with UNL's map, which is already a little bit larger, and then you push it out to include adjacent metropolitan counties, you can see, um, maybe tough for those of you, well, it might be easier for those of you online, but this jagged red line here is the county line. And you see we you know, jump over to Minnesota to include uh, 
you know, some, some of the metropolitan counties surrounding these larger cities. We get more of Sioux City. We get some counties around Omaha. We get a bunch of counties around St. Joseph and Kansas City. And then when we get to the South, then we're really, you know, we get Dallas. We didn't have Dallas before. Um, with those eight words, Cot can actually just about doubles the population of the region that he's talking about. And so when we talk about space in terms of region, part of it is kind of this interesting, like, oh, you know, what's in and what's out. But a significant part of it really affects what kinds of claims we can make about a region. So when the author of this report, Rise of the Great Plains, makes claims about the economic viability, the economic challenges that a region does or does not face, well, gosh, if you're including 8 million people that the reports that you're kind of responding to don't include, yeah, you're going to arrive at different conclusions. And so these questions of space are not merely historical or merely uh, trivial. Sorry to say merely historical. I know there's a number of historians here. Uh, not merely trivial, but they affect the sort of claims that we can make. And we could, this whole presentation could be about space, of course. But let's move on to time. So regions are interesting in terms of time because regions have no founded on date. And so it makes them more temporally flexible. It's easier to push the idea of region into the past or into the future than it is, you know, official borders like of a state or a nation. If someone says, well, you know, in the United States in 1250, we know that they're full of it because there was no United States in 1250, uh, right? But regions are a little bit different because since they don't, they're again, in that fuzzy area between official and unofficial, we can a little more easily manipulate them temporally. So we tend to project regions into the past, assuming that there's still a valid container. Remember that definition of regions, a uh, container for stories? Sometimes we push those containers into the past to kind of encompass stories that are older than they are. Uh, we see this very easily when we talk about American Indian history. We'll kind of group in, uh, different tribes into Plains tribes, which is, you know, and I don't want to suggest that that's in, uh, an invalid categorization. There are important cultural differences that that points out, but there's no evidence that any groups of Plains Indians regarded the region as a distinct region, right? And so that's actually a way largely motivated by convenience that we project regions into the past as kind of a way to contain a past that we would struggle to explain otherwise. So while the label does reflect, again, real cultural distinctions, it's more useful than it is accurate. An interesting demonstration of this kind of use of regional time occurred in a 1936 government report titled The Future of the Great Plains. And so this report was generated by the Great Plains Committee, which was charged by FDR. Again, this is during the Dust Bowl, during the Depression, charged by FDR to basically go out, catalog everything that's wrong, why it's wrong, and chart a future for this region. How do we fix what's going on? And they generate this 200-page report, which actually is a really interesting read. And in the beginning of this report, they actually begin it right after their little executive summary with this th series of three images. And uh, one, this is kind of an interesting example of visually uh, depicting a region um, as we so if we look at any one of these, you can kind of see all the features of the region are, are compressed into one vista, right? We have the Rocky Mountain foothills to the west. We have a large flat area. We have some water because we acknowledge that there's some water there. But what's particularly interesting about these images is how the authors are using time. Now, I do want to make a note. I'm going to put up the captions of the, these images. And the authors use a word for indigenous people that I would not personally used, so I'm going to skip over the word, but it will be there. And so this first image is the Great Plains of the past, as labeled by the authors. And this is their caption. As the first white settlers drove their covered wagons slowly westward across the seemingly limitless expanses of the Great Plains, they found indigenous people living in rude but productive harmony with nature. And then they 
go on in some poetic language, dustless winds. He had made his truce with them, with the elements of nature and with the land. Now there's a few things. Uh, again, the Great Plains is one uh, that's capable of explaining events even before the their story happens. What's interesting though is in their visual depiction, we have indigenous people hunting buffalo on horseback, which points to the influence of the Spanish because the Spanish reintroduced horses to North America from the South. And so it simultaneously points to some history that happened before the start of their story, um, but doesn't acknowledge it in any meaningful way. And then for later, we'll come back to this. Note the diplomatic language that they describe the relationship between man and nature. He had made his truce with them, with the forces of nature and with the land. So then if we move to the Great Plains of the present, again, this is 1936, uh, stuff is not very good. So we see there used to be a bunch of trees up here. Now the mountainside's all uh, completely bare. There's a lot of cattle crowded around, you know, very little food. We have drifts of dust down here. Um, it's really hard to make out even in the printed copy, um, but this sign says relief work. This says for sale for taxes. And so this image of the present where things are not going well, and it begins, the white man knew no truce. He came as a conqueror, first of the Indian, then of nature. They describe um, in very evocative language, kind of the current state said, and then they end by saying, for all the courage of their people fall into decay with poor schools, shabby houses, the sad cycle of tax sales, relief, aimless migrations. So this is the problem that the authors of this report are addressing themselves to. And the summation of their conclusions is this image, the great plains of the future. Say the land may bloom again if man once more makes his peace with nature. So there's that kind of diplomatic language. There was a truce. If man makes that peace again, they can succeed. At the end, they say the sun, the wind, the rain, the snow can be friends of man, not enemies. This is no utopian dream. It is a promise to be realized if we will. Now, as you can probably immediately recognize, the authors are very selective about what parts of this regional history are timeless and just need to be taken back up, right? This relationship with nature and which parts are just part of the past and we can't get back to, right? The relationship that indigenous people had is persistent, described as a promise to be realized if we will, but indigenous people themselves, as well as the Buffalo are nowhere to be seen and not addressed at all. So we have this selective nature of regional history. Some things are timeless, some things are obliviated uh, to the past. And this is pretty common. Um, the real heyday of regionalism as a thing is in this interwar period. And you see this quite a bit, this idea of kind of taking some things from the past of your region, but leaving others. What's important for our purposes right now is to recognize that it's the frame of region that makes this kind of problematic act of selection possible, right? If the authors were claiming to be talking about the history of a people, if they were talking about the history of these white settlers, they wouldn't really have the resources to spin this narrative, right? They wouldn't have that original truce to refer back to if they were claiming to do to write a history of the indigenous people, then they wouldn't have a way to just kind of ignore them in the present. And so the what enables this again, really problematic kind of selective history is this frame of region. So region lets us do a lot of things uh, and a lot of them not great. So space, time, and then finally, language. So we've seen the history of the uh, Great Plains, kind of different tensions with the words that we use to talk about the region. The classic one for the Great Plains is the garden versus the desert, 
there's a, a collection from the 1970s where a number of very smart people talk about different ways of depicting the planes. And even in 1974, I think it's David Emmons, he's saying this garden versus the desert is a banality by now. That was 50 years ago. I'm still talking about it, but you know, apparently it's completely banal. So, but this this is the classic matchup of planes images. So Stephen Long, uh, around 1819, one of the um, early, there's a lot of history before that, but an early explorer of the region, described what he saw as tiresome to the eye and fatiguing to the spirit, a sea of sand wholly unfit for cultivation, uh, which is maybe what you hear from people who drive through you know, these states on interstate, right? Tiresome to the eye, fatiguing to the spirit. And there were other interlocutors at the time, you know, kind of said, well, no, it's not that, it's this. Uh, David Emmons, the, who I just mentioned, reminds us that these characterizations are always due to some sort of external motive. No one comes and looks at a landscape, seemingly especially the Great Plains, without some kind of motive that motivates what they end up describing. So the US government wants kind of falls on the garden side of this because they want a garden for social reasons, for settlement, for a safety valve for the East. The idea being, yep, we've got you know social problems in the East, what was then perceived as uh, overcrowding or overpopulation. This area needs to be a garden because we want people to go there. The railroads, of course, massive land grants, want this to be a garden for economic reasons. They want customers, they want people to go out on the railroad, and then especially they want the people once they're there to be buying things that are brought in by the railroad and to be producing things which are taken back by the railroad. David Emmons points out, but the Great Plains had to be similarly reduced and brought into conformity and everything strange or alien had to be denied entrance or banished. And he's kind of talking specifically about America in the post-Civil War Republican era, era, where westward expansion is not just a matter of kind of logistics or infrastructure, but of spreading a certain kind of ideology. And so if you I mean, if your position is that this continent was given to the American people, then the idea that there's a vast part of it that just isn't very suited to you know, that Euro-American way of life, that doesn't track well with that idea. And so then it becomes really important to see it as a garden, or these two terms are sometimes presented as one turning into the other, right? A desert waiting to be turned in to an agricultural garden. Or, and this is a critique we're seeing more often now um, with, with kind of changing environmental sensibilities, a garden land of sufficiency when it was a grassland with people living successfully on it for at least 10,000 years, being turned into a monocultural desert, right? To be turning into a land of only production. So aside from the garden and the desert, there's also this question of rural, right? We often describe the Great Plains as a rural or predominantly rural region. And for many of us, that's how we understand ourselves or understand our backgrounds. Right? I come from a rural place, but like region, rural is one of those words that we use a lot, but are pretty shy about defining. Uh, it's notoriously hard to define. Most statisticians just kind of decide not to. Uh, like the census, they, they don't define rural, it's non-metropolitan, right? So that which is not urban or which is not suburban is rural. And so there actually is no kind of positive assertive definition of rural. In Rise of the Great Plains, that's that Joel Kotkin um, report I talked about earlier that had that really expansive map that included adjacent metropolitan areas. He consistently points to, points to rural as kind of an economic advantage. These places have work ethic and they're ready for economic development which puts us in a weird place because then the value of rural and rurality uh, is kind of in its readiness to become less rural, right? If the value of being rural is your willingness to develop or industrialize or urbanize, then the, strangely enough, the value of rural becomes a little bit self-defeating. Now, we often assume that rural means agricultural, Right, especially in uh, political speech. We kind of put those together. Um, and when we try to address rural issues, we'll often do those through ag programs. 
But this is less and less the case, right? And we know this in, um, well, really agriculture all over the country, but perhaps especially in the states that, that we're talking about, the parts of the states that we're talking about, as these economies of scale increase, these small rural towns that used to have their subsistence as kind of agricultural service centers are sometimes, are often bypassed, right? As these, as you don't go to your, you know, local, case part supplier to have a tractor fixed, they send a semi out to take it to a, a larger city. The definition of rural and agricultural no longer lay as a, exactly on each other as perhaps they used to. And this is a, a significant challenge. We sometimes make associations between rurality and self-sufficiency. But in truth, the Great Plains has never been a great example of a self-sufficient region. We talked about the history of railroads in the region, wanting the region to be a garden so that people there would buy stuff that had to be brought in by the railroad. And so they would produce stuff that needed to be brought out by the railroad. The Great Plains economic relationship to other areas has usually been the production of commodities. Very rarely uh, kind of this truly self-sufficient ethos that we like to express. Now, uh, you know, I grew up on a dairy farm, so I got up way too early, way too many more mornings to say that there is nothing to this claim of right work ethic in these areas. But we want to be careful on what we do with those claims and how we uh, justify them and what claims we make on them. Now, I'm currently part of a group, Rural Communication Scholars through Tarleton University uh, down in Texas, and we're investigating exactly this and other rural communication questions. One that I'm particularly interested in is what exactly do we mean by rural? Because if I'm talking about rural South Dakota, I'm asking very different questions than if I'm asking, uh, than if I'm talking about rural Appalachia or rural upstate New York. And so is the Great Plains rural? Maybe. But what does it mean to say so? This is one of the kind of lingering language questions about the Great Plains. Finally, uh, buffalo commons. Anyone know what I'm talking about when I mentioned the buffalo commons? Yeah, Evan, you wanna, you wanna share with the class? Yeah, the idea in 1987, Frank and Deborah Popper, a geographer and a sociologist from Rutgers University, were really, really kind of dug into county level data. And those of you who know some Great Plains history, 1987, mid 1980s, not a great time economically on the Plains. And they said, hey, these communities on the Plains are not doing well. And you know what? What we've been trying to make work in this region isn't going to work. It's never going to work. And they essentially said, we have to stop trying to prop up this system that doesn't work and allow the region to depopulate and return, and not the entire region, large swaths of the region, they had maps that identified which areas, and return it to uh, what they described in their first publication as basically a super duper national park called the Buffalo Commons. This was poorly received uh, across the region. What probably surprised the poppers most was that anyone found out about it, because it was in like a professional magazine, very specific to their field, but it eventually kind of got out. It became a political stump speech topic. And uh, the poppers really spent the next 30 years talking about this idea. And to their credit, after it became really controversial, they spent a great deal of time touring the Great Plains, talking about their ideas, sometimes under police protection when they went to and from their speaking venues. Because people, right, that prickly regional consciousness, when someone is talking about the place that we live or the place we grew up, we get defensive. Now, later on, they would go on to kind of moderate things a little bit and say, well, this isn't a land use proposal. They suggested that Buffalo Commons was a regional metaphor or kind of a guiding idea as we think about the future of this region and kind of development opportunities, excuse me, kind of a guiding idea um, you know, which of these ideas are consonant with the history of this region and which with perhaps a more sustainable form of economy. Now that their moderation of their ideas and kind of their more language fo focused explanation did not get nearly as much press as the initial idea, but we still see this Buffalo Commons name everywhere. 
right? On businesses, on events, McCook, Nebraska has the annual Buffalo Commons Festival, which is kind of a big uh, thumbs down uh, to the whole idea of the Buffalo Commons. And so this phrase itself, whether or not people know its origins, has become really influential when we talk about the Great Plains. So space, time, language. These are not the only ways that we tell regional stories or that we tell stories about the Great Plains. But again, they are some of the significant ones that come up again and again in my research. And there's not hard lines between them. You guys probably noticed any of my examples has aspects of each of these in it. Now, I always tell my students, and some of them are here, which is good. I always tell my students that they have a right and really a responsibility when we talk about something in class, and, you know, and they're always having a good time and laughing uproariously and whatnot, but a responsibility to ask, okay, so what? Right? This is interesting, but why does it matter? Well, how we see a region affects how we're able to identify and address that region's challenges. So if we see the Great Plains as primarily a breadbasket, then the region's future is primarily a question of production, you know, and of maximizing that production, or maybe of making trade-offs with the potential damages of that production. If we see it as primarily a grassland ecosystem, then that raises some serious environmental questions. Michael Forsberg, who has a, a great book, actually a photography about the Great Plains, says that there are two kinds of Great Plains communities, those that are dying and those that are growing at the expense of their environment. If the region does have a deep history, this thousands of years of history that we want to acknowledge, then we really need to focus on some difficult questions of Euro-American conduct and indigenous sovereignty. Now, I think we're a little bit better about that here in the Black Hills, largely thanks to the work of many Lakota activists. But I mean, as you guys know, almost certainly action is still very limited. I have yet to see regional, a regional frame used any appreciative effect in this regard. But I think the potential is there because of the, again, temporal flexibility of regionalism. Now, the most promising answers for these questions, as you might imagine, are some combination of all of them. Uh, and I think this is what a language focused approach to regionalism does well. So by looking at these physiographic definitions of region, political definitions, historical definitions, and other attempts to use this region as a tool of persuasion, communication scholars like me, with the help of other scholars, I stand on a lot of work that historians and geographers in particular do, can help us understand how we've been inventing and reinventing this region and how we might do it better. Thank you. Any questions? We haven't had any come in online yet, so in-person audience can. Yes. Uh, Walter Prescott Webb. Webb. Yep, Webb with two Bs. I think he's talking about a latitudinal distinction. So saying Texas up to, and that quote, uh, is kind of historically situated. So he's talking about at the time of kind of Euro-American encounter um, with the region when the state borders that we might refer to wouldn't have been included. So I think he's making a, a latitudinal distinction saying, you know, up to the level of uh, Illinois. Um, I agree though, when I was putting that in this phrase, I'm like, well, that's kind of weird, Walt. Um, but he doesn't, he doesn't take my calls, so. So I always advise my students to have a slide after your questions portion, because then you don't have to end in weird silence if nobody has any questions. So to kind of bring this to the present and some things that I'm currently doing, one of the questions I have right now, so we know that regions are invented, and we know that we've been inventing and reinventing the, region, the Great Plains for some time. A question that I have is, can we intentionally invent new or useful regions? You know, whether that means they get taken up and they become part of the, the census map or not, or whether it just becomes a useful frame to look at things, part of me wonders, can we 
invent these in useful ways. And I'm exploring this question through something I like to call the Northern Plains Archipelago. So we know that the Black Hills, where we are, is often described as an island on the plains, right? Because we have this broadly flat-ish expanse, and then suddenly we have kind of this almost outcropping of the Rocky Mountains uh, extending here like an island on the plains. But it's not the only uh, kind of sub-region, we might call it, that's described as such. The Little Rockies in Montana, the Bears Paws or Bear Paws or Bears Paw, we can go back and forth on that too, in Montana are described as such, as well as the Cypress Hills. Now, three of these areas, kind of little mini ranges, have really notable geological similarities, uh, which I won't claim to know any detail on because, again, I'm giving a presentation uh, for mine, so there's people who know more than I do, but they have real geological similarities. Uh, a couple of them, the Cypress Hills up here and the Black Hills, transgress kind of formal political boundaries, which is one of the interesting things that regions do. And so they kind of challenge us to um, examine closely the claims that we make about, say, South Dakota culture or Wyoming culture or Saskatchewan culture and Alberta culture, as well as this whole assemblage, this archipelago transgresses an international boundary. Right, And we make a lot of physiographic claims about the Great Plains, saying that the Great Plains or people on the Great Plains are like this because of the climate, the weather, the geography. That becomes pretty difficult to rectify with some important differences we see across the 49th parallel. And then also, all of these regions have a history of both resource extraction and conflict with indigenous people. And so part of the question I want to ask is, is there value in something like this? If we look at these as not each their own thing, but as a small region we might call the Northern Plains Archipelago, what insights do we potentially gain that we can't see if we look at any of these in isolation? And any of the images that you saw are either uh, available for use or cited here. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you again to everybody um, that attended in person and online. Uh, Steam Cafe is something that we do every third Tuesday. Um, so next month is uh, the date is October 19th, I believe, the third Tuesday. Um, and our speakers, uh, it's Duane Abada and Erica Hogfett. They are going to be talking about um, Ada Lovelace, who is a Victorian woman who has been credited widely as the first computer programmer. So she was doing computer programming back in 1843. Little did we know. So hope to see you then. Thank you for coming.